our first presentation. Sorry, just getting a few things organized. Um, our first presentation is from Cameron Davis, who is vice president at GEI Consultants. Um, also, sorry, if you could please make sure that you're muted. I'm getting a bit of background noise. So as I said, Cameron Davis is the vice president at GEI Consultants, where he helps the region with coastal resilience, green infrastructure, climate adaptation, and water resources. Since 2018, he has served as a commissioner at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. He was um, has also in the past coordinated work under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and was president and CEO of the Alliance for the Great Lakes. So thanks for being uh, with us today, Cam, and uh, whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Thanks, Veronica. Good afternoon, everybody. Really excited to be here with you and presenting with Mark as well. Um, one of the reasons I chose this picture for the cover slide is because of what it represents. I took this on, I think, October 2nd, and what was really interesting about it was um, behind me to the west on land was a perfectly clear dawn. Um, but if you look out to the east over the lake, you can start to see the sunrise. But more important, what you see is what looks like a mountain range. That's millions and millions of gallons of water leaving the lake, Lake Michigan, through evaporation earlier this month. Um, so for those of you who have always thought you cannot see evaporation, you can now see evaporation. You now have an example of what it looks like uh, in reality. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'm gonna dive into some of the details of communications, but one of the things I wanted to do was uh, mention that communications are as a general rule are fairly they can be fairly complex but some of the easiest things to understand about communications and i'll cover this again in detail is that they are often they often involve emotional hooks so when we talk a little bit about water levels and what they mean to us for example public safety is may not seem like a way to talk about lake levels but it really can be a way to engage people, uh, next slide, in the conversation about lake levels and what people need to be aware of. Here's my trivia question for the day. Name that year. And I wanna see if anybody wants to take a shot at this through the chat. Don't be shy, you're not gonna get an F. Good, I'm seeing 1980, another one popped up, 2020, 1985. All excellent. Um, uh, so, and, and many of these are correct. The one on the left is from 2020, it's from this year. Both of these are from Michigan. The one on the right is from the mid 1980s. We actually don't have a year for the photograph, but it was likely around 1986, 87. Mark, I think I saw uh, one of your chats pop up with a guess uh, in that time zone, and that's about right. They look like the same house, but they're actually different houses separated uh, also by about three or four decades or so. Let's go to the next slide. Point with that is, of course, that as we talk about lake levels, um, having those conversations in ways that people can actually see and imagine and visualize can be important. Uh, I'm gonna cover three Corps of Engineers graphs. I know John Ellis has been on the phone and uh, been part of the dialogue so far. I, uh, I also know you've seen these hydrographs before, but I wanna cover something uh, that's perhaps a little bit different about these graphs from a communication standpoint. First thing I wanna point you to with the Lake Superior graphic is how you see the red line and the blue dash line for that matter, serving as somewhat of a roller coaster. Going uh, lake level starting to descend around November, 
hitting a, a trough around March, starting to go back up, and then again in the fall, uh, heading back down. And that's a fairly consistent pattern. Let's go to the next slide. And you see the same pattern, even a little bit more pronounced, with Lake Erie, that roller coaster effect, that up, that seasonal up, then that seasonal down. Let's go to the next slide. Now look at this one. Here's your next trivia question. Does anybody notice anything different about the Lake Michigan and Huron water level hydrograph? Go ahead and chat away. I'm not seeing any chats, which means all of a sudden everybody's gotten yes. Now they're starting to come in, Casey, Nvidia. Um, you're all, you're all, you're all correct. Um, so you win a million, a million dollars for all your correct answers. You're not going to win it for me, unfortunately, but you are all correct. The difference here with lakes Michigan and Huron, which are of course hydrologically the same lake, is that you really see no descent. Um, starting in July of 2019, uh, the water levels for, for the two lakes basically stayed the same and then bumped up yet again in that March, April, May, spring time frame earlier this year. So even though the Corps of Engineers hydrographs are making their way around and people are are seeing them more and more. They're getting to become kind of a pop attraction in a lot of ways. The story within the story here is that red line. It's, it's the, this is a communications vehicle to tell the story about how our lakes can be viewed as budgets. When we're talking about high water levels or low water levels, it's a lot like your bank account where you have income, and you have expenses. Water going into the Great Lakes through rain and snow melt is a lot like revenue. It's a lot like income. Water leaving the Great Lakes are a lot like expenses. So uh, if this really were your bank account, you probably would like Lake Michigan and Lake Huron a little bit better than Lake Superior and Lake Erie because your income level tends to stay high or it tended to stay high last year and into the early part of this year. Um, but of course, the lakes are not like bank accounts where the money coming in or the water coming in is something that you want. What we do want are those healthy hydrological cycles, those natural ups and downs, because those natural cycles uh, mean a little bit more certainty for us, um, but how we communicate about lake levels is really important. And using these hydrographs and using these metaphors are incredibly powerful tools to help people understand. And most of the time when I get questions about lake levels, it's the questions are, why are they happening? Why are we getting these historic highs? The second most popular question is, when will they go back down? And so when people understand that lakes and rivers are a lot like budgets, they're a lot like bank accounts with incomes and outflows, um, then it helps them to understand that answering their own questions is also within their power. Um, if you want to know when lake levels are going to go back down, you'd think that you're being asked to somehow predict the future. But really, the answer is, well, when will we see water starting to leave the system? Or when will we see uh, precipitation tapering off? Those are the real answers. Uh, now, you can't necessarily predict those, but you can get a sense from this summer what we're likely to see next spring. Unlike last year around Lake Michigan, where 
you can remember that we actually had a very wet summer and a very wet fall, and the hydrograph bears that out. You're seeing that red line for yourself, charting that experience that most of us remember. Thank you for, um, for showing the red line. Um, we're not seeing that this year. We're not seeing, we didn't see that this summer. We saw a fairly typical summer in our area where it wasn't necessarily hot, but it didn't rain a lot either. Last year at this time in the fall, putting on my hat as a commissioner at the Water Reclamation District, the agency had to take the unfortunate last resort step of opening up some of our gates to let water uh, into Lake Michigan from the Chicago River system because of the immense rainfall that we had around October 2nd and October 3rd of last year that some of you also may remember. We have not had that kind of downpour this October. So what that suggests is heading into next spring, we are looking to see the return of a more typical hydrograph with that kind of roller coaster up and down, as opposed to what we saw last year where the roller coaster went up, it flattened out, and then it went up again. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide. I've already started to shine a light on some of the communications challenges that go along with uh, water levels, trying to predict them or forecast them is a more accurate word to use, um, to, and how to have conversations with people. Um, but some of the challenges that I've observed over the past 30 plus years of doing Great Lakes work is that um, people tend to think, we as people tend to think in binary terms, that's good versus bad, up versus down, uh, instead of variability, let alone what I call variable variability, which is uh, not just that lake levels naturally go up, they naturally go down, but they can vary in how much they go up and down. They can vary in terms of when they go up and down as well. This is very difficult for we as human beings to, to tackle. Uh, we like to think of things as on the one hand versus on the other hand. And when you're dealing with lake levels, the challenge in communicating this is uh, they tend to defy that kind of binary thinking. Um, so thinking of things in terms of inputs and outflows um, can be a helpful way uh, for those of us who uh, think in binary terms frequently. The other challenge I think we have, and you, you saw this illustrated in one of the slides that I, I showed before, <clears throat> is that the lakes have a much longer memory than we do as human beings. Um, I got my start doing Great Lakes work in 1986. And within the year, uh, by the fall of 1987, um, Homes were falling into the lakes. There was, there was, a, and we also saw waves crashing up over Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. There were a lot of pictures in the media at that time about that. There was a tremendous campaign around the Great Lakes to educate people to build structures back away from the Great Lakes, to move them as far away from the shoreline as they could. And Many of those education efforts uh, succeeded. We don't know how to judge um, how many homes have fallen into the lake that were moved back away from the lake, but we do know that there are still homes that are too close to the lake, as you can tell from the slide that I showed before with the two different years. The fact that this is still happening, the fact that people um, uh, still uh, are not attuned to the variability of lake levels shows that we continue to have a communication challenge when it comes to uh, building around the lakes. And I think another part of that is because uh, people often tend to think of the lakes 
as staying within a certain range, not going too far up, not going too far down. But as we have seen just from this past year alone, with many of the lakes breaking monthly record high water levels, um, we continue to be surprised. And there's also an assumption that somehow I think government will save us, that there are federal laws or state laws and ordinances at the municipal level that will not allow homes to fall into a lake. Uh, and while setback ordinances have gotten stronger around the Great Lakes over time, there are still a lot of structures that are grandfathered in. I know, for example, uh, wearing my other hat at GEI, we're undertaking a project right now to help move a 400 ton uh, historic structure backwards from the shoreline at Orchard Beach State Park in Michigan. Um, so the, the work of educating uh, people, decision makers about the need to move structures back is really important. Uh, and that just because uh, an ordinance may exist does not necessarily mean that those structures are on safe turf right now. Um, it's also not just about water levels. Uh, a lot of people want to know about lake levels and want a forecast about where they're going to be, but it's also, um, I think, part of the challenge, but also an opportunity to try to have the conversation in other ways that people can understand too. Part of why I mentioned or I used the um, bar graph at the very beginning of the presentation with a lake by lake accounting of drownings is because public safety really is a big concern when it comes to lake levels. Um, neighbor to neighbor relations are a big communications challenge as well. When we are looking at uh, structural changes to our shoreline to protect the coast, um, for example, those, uh, those projects can have impacts on neighbors. And one of the other dynamics that I've seen, the other challenges that I've seen over the decades, is how neighbors continue to be surprised uh, when other neighbors look to build projects and the kinds of impacts that those kinds of projects may create. Beaches, um, one of the projects that the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Coastal Management Program has funded and that we're participating in with the Delta Institute and Lake Bluff, Glencoe, North Chicago and Evanston uh, is to essentially try to address the loss of beaches as a result of high water levels. So, uh, water, so beaches and um, the ability of people to get out to the beach, especially these days when we're looking for outdoor activities uh, during the time of, uh, of pa the pandemic, uh, beaches become even more important. Ecological impacts are also another way to have a conversation about, about uh, lake levels as well. When lake levels go down, for example, propellers from ocean-going freighters and lakers, so those big cargo-bearing ships that we sometimes see out on lakes, a uh, prop wash from those vessels can stir up sediment in working harbors and rivers. And if that sediment is contaminated, that can pose a problem to ecological health. So on the flip side, it's not just high water levels that can create concern, it's also low water levels as well. Like we've seen in Lake Erie, when uh, we have had, had wet springs that have washed fertilizers downstream, and a, a relatively warm summer to incubate that, that algae, like the kind that effectively closed down the Toledo uh, metropolitan area's drinking water supply uh, back in 2014. And fisheries as well. There have been various studies that show that changes in lake levels and warmer lake temperatures, and we have some of the fastest warming lakes here in the Great Lakes anywhere around the world, uh, can have an impact on fisheries and uh, be more hospitable to invasive species. Let's go to the next slide as well. 
But with every challenge, there's also uh, opportunities. So I think one of the advantages that we have now is that e-communications are, are much more powerful than they've ever been. They keep getting more powerful by the day. We didn't have the web back in the 1980s, the last go around with our record high water levels where homes were also falling into the lake. Now that we have the web, now that we have um, social media, we're able to get the word out much further and more impactfully than uh, we were ever able to do back in the 1980s. Uh, as I mentioned before, lake levels are a vehicle to have much broader conversations about things that are very important to all of us, things like infrastructure, things like recreation, ecological health, climate change, water quality, uh, property values, um, our, our connection to our own municipal governments and our park districts is, is another uh, beneficiary uh, or can be to some of the, the water level variability that we see. Whenever people um, talk to me or want to know about lake levels and what they're going to do, I often try to find out why they're asking. Sometimes people are asking because the beach that they love to go to during the summertime is disappearing and they want to know if they're going to be able to get their kids there and do it in a way that won't be terribly crowded as we all try to do social distancing. Um, people sometimes want to know too because they have boats and they want to know if they're going to be able to get their boats in and out of certain places. Um, sometimes they're just intellectually curious, but either way, trying to understand the vantage point of the person asking the question really helps in terms of tailoring answers um, in a way that's that's most effective. Uh, the last major bullet here is a, a formula for communications um, that I've tried to use. This isn't really you know, this is in my head, um, not necessarily in any kind of academic textbook that you'll ever see, but um, communications really need to be simple, at least to start. Um, you know, when folks want to know about lake levels, what they may be doing and why they're doing it, um, I actually don't pull out a hydrograph. I don't carry one in my pocket with me, even though some of you may think I do that. Um, I just try to find out where people are, where they're coming from, what their interests are, and just have a very simple conversation. I also um, find using emotional hooks are very uh, helpful as well. Um, if people are concerned about lake levels going up because they own property on a lake, that's a very emotional thing to people. Um, they're concerned about losing property value. Um, things like that. Credibility is also vital in communications about uh, lake levels too, and that can bear on who the messenger is, who's talking, where people are getting their information from. Tangible, uh, the T in the S, uh, S E C T formula is also really important. Leaving people with tangible things that they can do. Let's go to the next slide is also uh, a really important piece of the formula as well. Um, I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, the Illinois lakefront and the in Indiana lakefront are among the most diverse uh, coastal areas that we have in the Great Lakes. And one of the big advantages I think we have is the advantage of long-term planning, asking ourselves, what do we want these coastlines to be how do we want them to act uh, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, even further out? And those, and that question about the long-term planning is a terrific way to have conversations and open the doorway to communications about lake levels and what they mean to all of us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit my uh, presentation there, but I do wanna just point you to the last two slides uh, that, that I have. Um, one of them is just to keep imagining what we can and should be doing next. And then some uh, resources for you as well that uh, I'm glad to share through this presentation. Let's go to the next two slides. 
a little bit more on the resources side, and then the next one, and this is contact information for anybody you'd like to reach out. And I'll close by telling a little story about this, this picture. This picture was taken uh, at diversity uh, in the diversity Harbor area in 2012 during Superstorm Sandy. That was not even a storm that was really in our the country. It was on the Eastern seaboard, but you can kind of see through this picture the kinds of impacts that can occur in the Great Lakes, even from distant weather patterns. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, stop there and look forward to Mark's presentation and Q&A later. All right, thanks, Kim. Um, we'll go ahead and ask, we received one question, so I'll go ahead and ask now before we sure. move on um, to Mark. So we do only have time for one question, but I'll keep Kim's uh, contact information up there if you would like to send him an email. So we received a question from Casey and she says, I'm curious when you saw education outreach around retreat fall off, did that correlate with action? Um, I think I need to understand the question a little bit better, Casey, um, but um, I'll take a whack at it. I think maybe part of what you're referring to is this notion of managed retreat, the idea of taking an asset and moving it out of harm's way rather than try to build some other kind of asset to protect the original asset. Um, I'm not a big fan of the term managed retreat. I think it sounds like we're giving up and we're, we're self-defeatist. Um, but I do like the idea of adaptation, that by moving structures, we're adapting to the new climatological realities that we're confronting. Um, as far as when we started to see that kind of adaptation work going on, you know, we've really seen it in earnest um, over the past two to three years, um, certainly over the past year to two years as those lake levels continue to go up. Thank you for All the right. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, 